Good evening. My name is Stacey Lazar. I'm the DMA League Director of Adult Programs here at the DMA, and I want to welcome you tonight. The talk tonight features artist Nadine Pierre, who is discussing her first solo museum exhibition, Nadine Pierre, What Could Be Has Not Yet Appeared, with Hilde Nelson, the DMA's Curatorial Assistant for Contemporary Art and the curator of this exhibition. I hope a few of you were able to see the exhibition, a very stunning exhibition before tonight's talk, but if not, it will be on view through May 2022. So I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Hilde Nelson, who's gonna then introduce and welcome Nadeline to the stage. Hilde joined the Contemporary Art Department at the DMA in July of 2018. In addition to Nadeline Pierre, what could be has not yet appeared. She has contributed to the solo exhibitions of Jonas Wood, Sheila Hicks, Wanda Koop, and Julian Sharir, just to name a few. And to the group exhibitions, American will be surveying the contemporary landscape for a dreamer of houses and Slip Zone, a new look at post-war art in the Americas and East Asia, which is currently on view in our barrel vault um, and should not be missed. So please also make time to see that show. Prior to joining the DMA, Hilde held positions at Creative Time in New York, the Julius Caesar Gallery in Chicago, and the Williams College Museum of Art in Williamstown, where she curated the exhibition Bodies of Substance Shadow in 2016. She earned her BA with honors in history from the University of Chicago, and her MA in the history of art from the Williams Graduate Program. So please join me in welcoming Hilde Nelson to the stage. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. So I have the distinct privilege and pleasure of introducing Nadeline Pierre. Um, and to give a little background on Nadeline, uh, she received her MFA from the New York Academy of Art in New York and a BFA from Andrews University in Michigan. Later this year, her work will be featured in Prospect 5 New Orleans and beyond this show, uh, she participated in uh, the 2019 to 2020 Studio Museum's Artist Residency, and her work produced during that residency was exhibited in a three-person exhibition at MoMA PS1 as a culmination of the program. She has also participated in a number of group exhibitions, most recently at the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, the Perez Art Museum Miami, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Her work belongs to permanent collections, including uh, our own, uh, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, the National Museum of Art at Duke University, and the Perez in Miami. But beyond simply her biography, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of her work before I introduce her to the stage. The supernatural and unseen peer out into our world from the painted elsewheres imagined by Nadine Pierre. In her works, fantasy offers escape with care, protection, and love to be found in another world that is at once amidst and beyond us. Multiplicity of memory, of experience, and of being are embedded in the artist's central protagonist, a femme figure who beams jewel-like from the ethereal, swirling compositions. In the other worlds of the paintings, Pierre's protagonist and the supernatural subjects transform and are transformed in ways beyond our imagining and understanding with possibility for renewal and expansion in every encounter. The title of the show, What Could Be Has Not Yet Appeared, gestures towards Nadine's interest in considering the things unseen that envelop and surround us, and the ways in which the fantastic can offer space a protection and escape. While her works are in conversation with the iconography and technical approaches of European religious painting, they depict a visual vocabulary that is entirely her own, 
one in which the narratives and encounters in the paintings are indeterminate and opaque. In that sense, while they serve as beautiful portals for us, the viewers, they are also deeply personal creations and worlds. And with that, I'd like to welcome Nadlene to join me on the stage and we can begin having our conversation. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I kind of um, mentioned this at the beginning or in my remarks, but I'd like to start with the title of the show because I think that's a good entry point into your work. Um, what could be has not yet appeared. So for me, I'm curious, what is the interest for you in the idea of the unseen? And how do your work strive to imagine what the in unseen is and could be? And I guess I'll start with some slides of the work too. The title of the show, um, What Could Be Has Not Yet Appeared, I think gestures towards this idea of possibility in the unknown and really uh, like sinks its teeth into this idea of creating a future I haven't yet seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's so much in imagination and in using that as a way of survival and escape. And I think the show allows for that in the works and also in the title. Mm -hmm. For sure. And we talked, I mean, in developing the show and in talking through your work, we talked a lot about those ideas of, of transformation and of love and of protection, which you can really clearly see in works like Lest You Fall, which is part of our collection. and to me is such a beautiful example of, of the ways in which you demonstrate a kind of, of collective connection and care. Um, and it's especially happening through these interactions between the protagonist who recurs throughout your work and the figures around her. So I'm interested if you can talk more about, about these characters who are traversing the space and how, and how they're enacting these encounters because they are kind of the things unseen. Yeah, a lot of these scenes in these um, compositions are moments like in the in-between mm -hmm. and um, transitional moments. Um, like I said this morning, a little bit like kind of like stills of a film mm -hmm. um, where we know there's more happening outside of the limits of the canvas, um, but what we see is what we see, um, but there's so much possibility outside of like that image. Um, and I think these characters are always caught in really tender moments, moments of care, moments of mm -hmm. trust. Um, and in this painting, Lest You Fall, it's kind of like a snapshot of motion. This mm -hmm. central figure is falling, but um, has these other characters there to kind of catch her if she needs. Um, and I think it is, yeah, the rest of the works in the show and the rest of the works that I, I feel like I've made um, kind of point towards care and tenderness within these characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, I think it would be interesting maybe to, I'll skip to this, to, because I think thinking about those ideas of care and protection, I think this one has been kind of interesting in people's reaction to it because, you know, so much, especially like that snake and being enveloped in flames, it, it definitely harkens back to a kind of um, symbolism of menace or symbolism of, of something encroaching. But yeah. I think you have a very different view of it, and I'd, I'd be interested to yeah. hear more about that. I really enjoy remixing things and kind of turning them around, using them for my, like to kind of meet my needs. So we, we have this idea of a serpent that mm -hmm. carries so much meaning across different cultures. Um, and in this case, it's not so much of a menacing kind of presence, but a presence that's bringing these two characters together in a really intimate, um, very kind of ambiguous moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I use some of this like iconography throughout the work in that way, whether it's a star or a halo or a dove um, or an embrace, I think it's all, like they're all tools mm -hmm. to help me get to the image that I wanna see and that I wanna make. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, I'll skip ahead. Sorry, there's gonna be some bouncing around because <laughs> all of the works I think really speak to this. 
Um, but I think you've sort of shown that too in, in the ways that these encounters are both you know one-on-one, -on -one, but also in something like Lest You Fall or Hold On, Hold Tight, that they're kind of group scenes. I mean, do those dynamics influence how you're approaching this idea of like connection and tenderness in terms of like the, the various players in the scene, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, I'm making images that I wanna see. I wanna see images um, where they're kind of taking from this long history of painting, figurative painting, history painting, religious mm -hmm. kind of painting, and replacing those kind of um, known characters with some of these unknown characters mm -hmm. that are playing with texture and color. Um, and in these moments, you can kind of see that all of these figures are kind of a whole in this moment. Mm -hmm. But if you break into some of these individual kind of moments with the face, these little vignettes, you can kind of see that they each have their internal kind of worlds that they're also processing through. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoy zooming out and looking at the images as a whole, like these groups kind of as one. And then I also enjoy kind of expanding the worlds of these different accessory characters. And so the this orange figure that's kind of like radiating this light mm -hmm. is this protagonist that reoccurs in um, my work. And she is sort of cared for and held by these other angelic celestial beings um, in, in different colors and different parts of these worlds that I'm building out. But yeah, they're together, but they can also seem like they're alone. Yeah, and I would love to to talk more about the protagonist because she is, you know, the through line through so many of these things, and, and you're definitely creating work where she's not in it now, but but I think she's been probably the most consistent figure throughout. Um, and we've talked a lot about her being kind of a not an, an avatar to think through ideas of transformation and change, and I think that might be a way of um, leading us into talking about some of the newer work. Um, because in this work, it's becoming especially evident that she's going through changes and transformations. Yeah. So if you could talk through some of that. Of course, I think the origins, or her origins, I, I used to think of her as kind of an alter ego. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've gotten to know her and spent more time making the work and making the images, I'm realizing she exists in an alternate universe mm -hmm. um, somewhere else, and I can only meet her at the canvas. And so, she has her own experience, her, her own agency, and is a being outside of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and though we share some moments, um, we're completely separate. And so she becomes a vessel that I can then parse through um, some of my own experiences or um, experiences I've absorbed or imagined. Um, and I can then process through those things through her and she allows me access into her world, into her feelings, along with the characters um, that she's kind of existing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. And I guess sticking with maybe some of, some of the newer works too, I think the fact that she's kind of changing and, and growing um, is especially evident in some of these new ones and really ties into notions of what we talked about a lot in the development of the show was, was an idea of escape and these places being an escape to and elsewhere. And I think that looking at this and looking at, at, at her and how she's kind of shifting and transforming, um, especially with things like, uh, I think we can spend some time with, sorry, whoops. Hopefully it doesn't, oh. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> You're getting a little sneak preview of everything. Um, but something like Power Within, you know, we've kind of seen, and I'm sure as you're seeing as we're going through the PowerPoint, that you know, there's moments of, of flame and of her glowing and of her shifting and changing. Yeah. Um, and what it, in a work like this, what are you are hoping to offer her or hoping to express for her in, in this moment of like very radical, I think, power and yeah. dynamism? Yeah. She's transforming. And as I'm getting to know her and these other characters, I'm seeing that she's understanding her power and what she can do with it. In this case, it's manifesting itself in the form of fire, which I use a lot in my language mm -hmm. um, to signify transformation, purification. Um, and I think here in this particular piece, uh, you can kind of see that she's conducting energy um, kind of at the center with her hands and it's taking the form of flames. Mm -hmm. 
but then like a more stylized um, flame becomes a wing for her. And so this is the first time she's appeared in the work as being able to fly. So I'm getting to know new things and she's also getting to know new things about her. And so the title Power Within is, is pointing towards that moment where she's realizing I can do this. And she has this host of characters that are flying along with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will hop back a little so you can you can all kind of see. I mean, sort of what what you're talking about. And I don't I don't have a, a pointer, so just, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, even on her back, you can sort of see these flames, kind of. Yeah. So in this her, composition, yeah. one there's the presence of water, which is quite new for me. Yeah. Um, I'm exploring these worlds and kind of finding out new elements, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but in this moment, she's kind of in a state of rest while she's being kind of propped up by this other character, um, partly submerged. And you see these characters around her that are wielding fire and kind of bringing that fire to her and encouraging. She has tiny flames on her back that then become larger wings, but this kind of um, character in the center is like slightly blowing on those, kind of fanning the flames and, mm -hmm. and like encouraging her to kind of wield that power. So um, I think it's a really tender, sweet moment. She's mm -hmm. kind of receiving a blessing and also um, encouragement to, to fly. Yeah, I would love to hear more too, just hearing about knowing the water is, is something you're kind of exploring and obviously the fire, they're very elemental things. Um, how, how you're seeing them maybe operating, the idea of fire and water operating against each other or in concert and how that's kind of shifting the nature of, of these worlds yeah. uh, as you're moving forward. Fire and water to me, not only are they really useful compositional elements in terms of the space of the painting, they also are quite similar. They can destroy, they can build up, they can make worlds, they can take them down. Um, they can cleanse, they can purify, and when they come together, they make steam. So I think that they kind of, these elements are kind of swirling around e each other and, and creating new avenues for me to explore this world. And um, in this moment, you can kind of see fire kind of in a couple different ways. You have this tiny wing that's mm -hmm. forming on her back. You also have these really graphic black flames and then you have these like kind of line work kind of mm -hmm. in the hands of this like character on the top right. Um, but yeah, I think fire and water just, they have so many similarities and they can be scary and powerful and uncontrollable and uncontained, but they can also be really small and take on different shapes and, mm -hmm. and move through this world. Yeah, and actually I think that's a nice transition to, I mean, this obviously features a lot of flame, but I, the, what you're saying about fire and water also gestures to, to my mind, your interest in, in the idea of mutability and change and progression. And so much of that is in your use of, of the gradient and color, which is not just in this, it's unless you fall, it appears in moments throughout the work. So I would love to hear more about your thoughts on, on the power of the gradient and, and of color more generally. I think, I mean, yeah. as you can easily see, your use of color is so distinctive. And yeah. Color is so huge for me. I think color contains so much and can tell us so much. And I think it can kind of move us towards feelings that maybe words can't. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in this, in this work I wanted to kind of challenge myself. So I started it just purely in black and white, kind of monochromatic. And then I went back in and added color to kind of lift out some of the lights and the darks in the composition. But um, color, Gradient, all of that is a tool for me to kind of um, signal transition and change and this in between that I keep talking about. Yeah. A green going into a red, kind of fading through. Um, this kind of gray kind of turning into a darker black. Um, all of it signals change and in this, this particular painting, Hereafter Ye Shall Be Changed, this is a lot about um, yeah, transition and being kind of in a liminal space, but understanding that that's uncomfortable, but understanding there's also power in accepting change too. Yeah, and also I think um, this this use of color in this different way is is 
sort of new in the work and how you're thinking about color and its absence and the ways it's peeking through. And I thought that this, this is a nice transition to talk about the Guardians because they're so, you know, they're a much darker palette, but there there's these moments of these things peeking through and emerging and changing. So, uh, and the Guardians, I think, as figures are really interesting as in the role they play in your work. So if yeah. you could talk more about them and, and where they kind of exist in relationship to, to you and to the other figures, yeah. the other characters. The Guardians is, I, they're part of a larger series that I've begun mm -hmm. and I started at the um, exhibition at MoMA PS1 with some more chromatic Guardians and um, I wanted to challenge myself to create work that first was kind of technically different for me in terms mm -hmm. of um, having a really vertical, narrow, kind of large scale um, surface to paint on. Mm -hmm. But then I wanted to see if I could still get at feeling without including the essential um, character. And for these guardians in particular, I started um, with a monochromatic uh, kind of palette, mostly just to challenge myself technically. Mm -hmm. I like throwing a wrench into things and seeing how I can get out of pickles and like, ooh, like how can <laughs> I make this work? And it keeps things exciting for me. So just like there's mystery in the work, mystery in my process is really important too. Mm -hmm. And so for these in specifically, and also for Hereafter Ye Shall Be Changed, I really, really, really wanted to challenge myself to step away from color and then add it in at the end um, to kind of highlight some of these darks and lights and areas where I feel like needed it. But um, these are special to me, these two, I wanted them. I mean, we talked a lot about yeah. the space and I knew that I wanted to create guardians kind of flanking the exit of the gallery because mm -hmm. I wanted, you know, on your way out of the gallery to kind of feel this presence, this protection, kind of like um, these guardians looking down on you and like ushering you out of the space with kind of like a message of care. Um, and so, I think when you look at them, they're kind of looking down and towards like each other. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how that came about. But I was really excited to just work with black and white and gray. And I just got a bunch of different blacks because there's so much nuance in black. Yeah. Black isn't just flat black. There's warm black, cool black, brown black. Um, there's so much within black. And I think conceptually that's really interesting to me as well. Like thinking about the word black and how it can be flattened and how it actually is really expansive. And so um, these like contain all of that. Yeah. And I would love actually, I think that that last point is really interesting and, and if you could expand on it because Obviously, I think these works, and when we're talking about notions of escape and protection, they're, you know, the next question is kind of for whom? And I think you've talked explicitly about you know, blackness and femhood and, and these identifying markers being important and obviously like informing everything that you do, but that they can be very limited in, in how people are reading your work and, and what you're trying to say. So if, if you could talk more about that, because I, I think that honestly that's, that's the bit when, when reading criticism or reading reviews of your work that it can feel sometimes like there's a flattening in that sense too. Yeah, yeah. I think people want to understand things and categorize them, but I think I thrive in moments where I can be expansive and I want these worlds to be expansive as well. And even the fact that all of these characters appear in so many different forms, textures, scales, mm -hmm. um, colors, um, it just really points towards multiplicity and the multiplicity I feel that I have and that I'm owed. Um, and so in these works, they are reimagining so much and there's so many doors where you can enter the work through so many lenses you can see the work through. So um, for me, it's important that expansiveness is at the forefront. I want to be able to um, not be boxed in and I don't want these characters to be boxed in either. Mm -hmm. I think that the work is celebrating um, my experience as a black woman and all of the beauty and like complexity that I think we carry um, as black women. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see that in something as simple as all of the different hairstyles in the work mm -hmm. and textures and colors. Um, 
but I also feel like there's so much more to think about in the work as well. Yep. We can think about the relationships between these characters. We can think about sorrow and joy and love and passion. Um, there's so much, mm -hmm. you know, and I just want that to be part of the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. And I, to my mind, that's a, a nice transition to thinking through. Um, one of the, the pairings that we really wanted to do was thinking about your work in conversation with, you know, art historical legacies um, without necessarily using those to overdetermine your work. Uh, and so one, one, sorry, some of these images are a little bigger. Uh, so this work, Too Much, Not Enough, is, is currently installed. It's not in the Focus 2 space. It's installed in our European Permanent Collection Galleries on the second floor. And I know my part of my interest in that was that I think you're, as you were saying, your works in some level speak to like very you know, deeply human experiences of, of faith and wanting connection and a belief in another world. But this might be a good opportunity, I think, to talk about your relationship with maybe the idea of, you know, and, being critically like of a canon and, and, and how you see yourself operating in conversation or against it. Yeah. It's clear that, you know, I am inspired by like the old masters as the term is, which is, mm -hmm. has its own yeah. thing, right? Like I'm just yeah. going <laughs> to leave it right there. Um, I can't help what I'm drawn to, mm -hmm. um, but I think my struggle, my questions have always been, how do you take something that can feel so exclusionary mm -hmm. and how do you insert yourself in that conversation, not to be erased, but to be in the room with these works and to have that conversation with those works. Um, and I think when we were speaking about the show, we wanted to include a work in the European collection, kind of show it within that context, but not so much as like, as a way to that, like mm -hmm. give a little validity to my work, but to, to add to the conversation, right? Like I don't wanna be explained away through the lens of those who have come before, but we're always ex you know, exclusionary. Mm -hmm. But I think being in that European gallery alongside some of the imagery that I think is really beautiful um, but does not include me, um, it's really special. And I'm still honestly trying to process what that means for me yeah. and my work. But I do think that there needs to be space for other voices. And I'm creating images that I want to see. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have it there. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm very happy about it being there. So um, I do want to also, so these, these works that we've kind of led with are all on the show, but I, I would like to expand the conversation outward um, to your wider practice too. So skipping ahead a little bit, um, I'm gonna pull up a sh an image. In theory, I'm gonna pull up an image. Um, of your show at MoMA PS1, because I, to me, so, you know, there's the guardian figures, like how these things are working. Um, but would love to talk more about, I mean, we spoke, you mentioned a little bit about the guardians and their space in our galleries, but thinking through installation for you, because this was a really interesting mode of installing your work and how you kind of see them spatially um, in relation to viewers as they walk through. Yeah. I am so invested in the experience of ingesting the work. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to make the painting and put it on the wall. I want the space to feel different and that can include wall color. It can include um, the way that a painting is hung, how low it is to the ground, what is the eye level for the average you know, person. Mm -hmm. um, and with these works, I was really, um, really invested in the, the color of the wall. I wanted it to feel like a sanctuary, kind of church-like, mm -hmm. quiet, damp, dark, but also which, with kind of like a little bit of space for people to react to the paintings emotionally without bright lights kind of interrupting that moment. Because mm -hmm. I think there's, there's something transcendent about placing yourself in a work or like experiencing something that feels like another place but also feels familiar. Yeah. Um, and so I'm always thinking about that experience for the viewer and, and honestly for myself as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I don't have an image of it right now, but in contrast, thinking maybe you could talk through your our conversations of the thought process of, of the installation here at the DMA because it's kind of the opposite in terms of the brightness and the experience of walking through the space. Yeah. Well, if you've been in the room, mm -hmm. um, when you walk in, it's quite bright, but the walls are not white. They're like a very pale, um, purpley kind of mm -hmm. lavender. And I wanted, one, to just not have white walls because I think conceptually having some color in the walls makes me feel a little more welcome. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that I wanted um, a very soft black on the walls on the way out because I wanted it to feel like on your way out, you're kind of entering a portal and you're taking a little bit of that experience with you as you leave. And so um, I was really thinking about color in that way. And the use of red for me and some of the signage was really important because I think red is a, a color of power mm -hmm. and of passion and also of heat and warmth and fire. And so I wanted to combine all of that to create a space that not only opens up into some brightness, which is contrasted to what I did here, mm -hmm. but then allows for some pensive kind of takeaways as you leave the space. Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to, I think that we have an image of it. Yeah, so there's the guardians and all of their glory. Yeah, the first guardians. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, they're beautiful. Um, but yeah, even in here, I think, so hopefully you can see from this image that they, these works are not hung um, flush with the wall, that they're leaning out a little, yeah. um, which I find so interesting. It's so rare you see something like that. Yeah, I wanted to inject the space with these characters. I wanted to change the viewing experience where you feel like they're leaning over you and you can kind of walk around to see the space behind the paintings. And I think hanging work in kind of a non-traditional way was a way for me to kind of break the space and also break tradition. Mm -hmm. Not only am I breaking tradition with the colors that I use and some of the imagery, but also in the way that the paintings are hung. And it was really fun trying to figure out <laughs> mechanisms so that the paintings wouldn't fall and um, they could lean out from the wall. It's really great. Yeah. Well, this is also, so the works, I mean, that show was last year, which, yeah. Pan pandemic time, it feels like four billion years ago. But um, thinking, looking at, you know, the show, our show spans from 2017 to 2021. And you can see that the work has grown and changed. And I'm curious how, how you've kind of seen it transition. And these are some of the earlier works where you can, you can see some of the elements that are happening in the most recent work. But you know, kind of how, I mean, you speak so beautifully about the idea of change and your work clearly reflects that, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can see the connections between the work, the newer work um, that's in the gallery today and some of these older works from, I think, 2018, 2019. Um, colors are quite similar, textures are, are quite similar. You see that there's a serpent here as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like, reaching back into older work and pulling some of those things forward. Mm -hmm. um, like in the top right corner of this painting over here, you can kind of see this like barely perceptible like uh, kind of rendition of, of, of a few figures kind of watching over these other figures. And you can also see that in Hold On, Hold Tight, which is in the show. Um, here right now. So I think change is important. And I also think embracing the past, reaching back into the past mm -hmm. and bringing it to the future is also important. I'm constantly in evolving as a person and I think the paintings are as well. And um, I'm, I embrace the change and look forward. I think some of the work in this new, these new works, I think the, the central character is in motion. Mm -hmm. She's a little bit, um, her, her body language has a little bit more power, but still has some of that tenderness that we see in the older works. Yeah, and actually I think, sorry, we're gonna skip way ahead. Uh, so, the one I'm looking for, I think is at the very end, there we go. Yeah, and I mean, even in these more recent works, you can see kind of the dynamism yeah. changing. Yeah. Um, and her growing her flaming wings. Yeah. This painting on the left, I made kind of as a response to Lest You Fall, mm -hmm. where 
she is also painted in this really vibrant orange mm -hmm. um, color. Um, in Lest You Fall, she's kind of falling backwards or upside down, and here she's leaping up. And so I kind of wanted to complete the circle with similar, I guess, imagery, but just kind of reversed. And so um, it, it felt good to do that and, and then display that painting um, in the show at PS1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yes, these paintings, I think as she's growing, this, this protagonist, there's a lot more um, dynamic kind of compositions and, and body language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, while we're on this note, I think your thoughts on the idea of narrative are really interesting because, you know, as we talked about this project, for me, I mean, one of my big questions is always, you know, are these meant to be kind of in a linear sequence? Is there, you know, a, a storyline, for lack of a better term? And for you, that's that's not your interest in this. Is it's not a progression in yeah. like a trackable sense. Yeah, no, it's definitely nonlinear in terms of a narrative. In fact, time, gravity, light doesn't work the same in these worlds here. So mm -hmm. past, present, sometimes she's caught between both. So um, I enjoy not knowing things and not having them figured out. And so if I can just have snapshots of what's happening, maybe one day I'll know. But for right now, I'm enjoying the unknown. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to go back a little bit. Yeah, and I think, um, too, I would love to hear more. So you've worked in a number of different formats as you're thinking through these ideas. So, you know, large triptychs, and I'll go back a little more, too, and in things like altar pieces. So, and you've talked about that you're kind of moving into more sculptural work. So are you seeing those different mediums through a different lens? Are you approaching them differently? Or are they kind of part and parcel of, of your practice and, and how you're approaching this creation of space, because now you're moving into you know, literal space. Yeah, I think ultimately it all boils down to me wanting to build an imaginary space with mm -hmm. essential imaginary friends. Yeah. And whether that's a two-dimensional surface or an altarpiece that kind of opens out and it kind of projects into the space or a sculpture or sound or performance, all of it points back to the imagination and it points back to imagining a future that I have not seen, but, but hope exists somewhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I'm just open to, to where these characters allow me to go. And I place the agency like on the canvas for them to then gift me with images. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. um, between me and the character. So who knows where I'll end up, but yeah. I'm having a good time figuring it out and making more and more work. Yeah. When, you, um, when, you're, when you're making these roles, you obviously have a very personal relationship to them. Is there a certain kind of experience that, like, or an emotion or a tactile quality that you're hoping for the viewer to pull away? And maybe that's different for every viewer or every scenario. But yeah. you, I think your relationship to it is so, so intensely intertwined. Yeah. Ultimately, I'm making this work as a, as a mode of healing and understanding and hopefully injecting it with my own feelings and trying to imagine the feelings of these characters. And the most I can ask for is that the viewer also then is transformed by seeing these works and maybe they're transported to a place outside of the everyday, outside of the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, a place where you can only get to through that feeling in your heart that like you feel expanded um, and kind of hopeful. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at some point, you know, viewers take what they want yeah. and yeah. their experience with the work, it's so hard to, <laughs> to yeah. dictate that. Yeah. Um, but I, I a question I've been asked a lot as we've been doing this lead up is sort of, you know, what grabs you about this work? What's exciting for you? And, you know, I, uh, sorry, I gotta check my cheat sheet where it is. Um, you know, I look at these works and to me, there's such a, 
like I, I, indescribable emotional quality. You know, the the first work of yours I saw in person was Descent from 2016, and yeah. it was a hand. I, I I don't think we have it in this slide, but it was a hand on a leg that it just I looked at it and could could feel that, and yeah. so you know this idea of touch and conveying that I think is so very clear in your work mm -hmm. and. Um, Actually, I think that you speak very beautifully about this idea of like moments of connection and closeness. Yeah, so. I mean, with this work in particular, I was thinking about a sort of uh, paternal and maternal love, like a like a parents and, and a child, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about what that is like and the thrill of of feeling that love. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that it just you know I can just put feeling into work and people feel what I feel. Yeah. Um, or maybe they feel new things that I don't know, or I, I don't anticipate that they'll feel. But um, I don't know. I don't know. All I want to do is make authentic work that I can connect to and that people can connect to as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know. From the responses I'm hearing, people are connecting to it, which is great. I hope so. so. Yeah. Well, I think we have time. We can keep talking about individual works, but if, if anyone has any questions, we'd love to, to open the floor to, to any of your questions. Um, otherwise, we can, we can keep talking. Oh, I see a hand. If, if you want to just stand up and, and say, I'll, I'll repeat your question, so. You don't have to stand up. Sorry, I did not mean to like call you out like now you have to stand up. You do not have to stand up. I apologize. Um, I'm about, I two Okay. Mm -hmm. like the halo sort of like aura thing that's everywhere and it seems to be um, happening in different births in different places so sometimes it's like attached to the dove and sometimes here like it's mm -hmm. it is a white light and sometimes it feels very sharp and it just takes on a lot of different forms is there a reason for that is it just how it feels in that moment with that spark or mm -hmm. So to really quickly just repeat the question so everyone can hear it, asking questions about these bursts of light, which are appearing in multiple forms. You know, here it's it's kind of a star burst. It's also, you know, emitting from the doves and from the protagonist herself. So yeah, how those are operating. Light is very important to me, and I had quite a traditional kind of education in terms of, of traditional painting, and light has mm -hmm. always been so important. But I wanted to kind of break the rules, and so being able to control light made me feel powerful, makes me feel powerful um, to like keep it in the present. Um, yeah. So these like bursts of light, whether it's a halo or kind of coming from a cloud or a figure, that's just like my nod to feeling like I'm a creator, a world builder, and I control light. And so it, it does give me a feeling of agency and power when sometimes in my reality, I don't feel that in my day to day. Um, and then there's also, you'll notice like kind of kind of star, kind of pinpointy kind of um, objects becomes a compositional element just to speak technically. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, for me, it's kind of like a point to divinity. Um, and, and the presence of something special, but that's unseen. Yeah. yeah. And then you said you had a second question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I don't know whether you put it as you inventing the protagonist or the protagonist finding you, but what was going on in your life when that occurred and how old this work started in grad school, and one of the paintings in the show is kind of my take on a Pieta, oh, yeah. um, and it's called Hold Me This Way. It's kind of the beginning of when this work started, and, and I was, what, 25, mm -hmm. 26, not too long ago, but um, <laughs> I wanted to, firstly, she found me. And she has helped me through a lot in my life, and we've grown side by side. And I think, I don't know, it's like a sisterhood, I think, that we have, an imagined sisterhood at this point, but a sisterhood nonetheless. Um, and I'm still categorizing our relationship or trying to understand it, 
but I know that she holds my hand through a lot. And I can't pinpoint exactly what I was going through at the time. I think I'm always going through something. Um, but having her support throughout the last several years has been really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, way in the back. Um, and I hear on that you opposed the protagonist, and I'm wondering about the other characters, and if you would repeat any of them in your paintings, um, and if you haven't mentioned it, if there are there some favorites of yours that you left out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to just make sure everybody heard that. Just explain, you know, expounding on your relationship with some of the other figures, whether they're recurring and, and kind of how you feel connected to them, because yeah. I mean they're different than the protagonist yeah. for sure. They've grown a lot, mm -hmm. these other characters. Here at the start of the work, they were more amorphous, less detailed, kind of yeah. more ghostly. And as I've spent more time with them, they've revealed themselves to me. Um, and I get to see them a little bit more with some clarity. But I think the protagonist feels loved and cared for by these um, accessory characters. And through her, I feel it too. Um, mm -hmm. So I think our relationship, not just with the protagonist, but with these other characters, I think it's growing as well, the relationship between this group of, of femme characters, mm -hmm. powerful characters that kind of um, envelop this Protagonist, I also feel that in the paintings. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers, but. Well, is it something you repeated them? Oh, if I repeat them, right. Um, unintentionally, I have seen some through lines in some of them. Um, I try to let themselves just reveal and kind of come through um, the painting process. And when I step back, I can see patterns and um, characters that I feel mm -hmm. like visit me again. Um, but I let them have agency and let me know when it's time to kind of bring them into the composition. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you want to. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Recap. <laughs> yeah, to be the, the quick recap. Yeah, so questions about, you know, clearly a deep connection with the protagonist, and, you know, even on a spiritual level, and, and what happens when, I'm sorry, I'm so poorly paraphrasing this, but what happens when. Um, when I can't, can't tap in. Yeah, when you can't tap in and kind of how you yeah. can reestablish that connection. Well, it does happen. <laughs> Sometimes I have to take a step back. Nature helps a lot. Music, solitude, um, and also revisiting some of these um, older works. Um, I've spoken about El Greco. I've mm -hmm. spoken about William Blake, Bob Thompson. Um, these are works that I can come back to and kind of get that spark again from. Um, but it is a spiritual experience. And I do feel like these paintings are kind of like prayers. And um, sometimes I feel lost, but then I get found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. 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 In Sca terms of scale, scale. <laughs> yeah. the question is scale. Scale. In terms of scale, I either 
love to go really, really small and jewel-like and kind of intimate, or I like to go life-size or around a life-size. I've just started playing with larger-than-life figures in The Guardians, but ultimately I want to be able to feel like I can step through the canvas and fit into that space. Mm -hmm. And so having the, the figures close to life-size mm -hmm. allows, I think, for that experience, not only for me, but for the viewer. Like with The Guardian, um, uh, yes, yeah. Guardian somewhere, I spent a lot of time with this painting at eye level with mm -hmm. this character here, um, kind of at the midway point. And those like intimate moments are really important and I wanted to replicate that in the hanging of the works. So mm -hmm. it's hung quite low in the gallery because I think you know those moments are really important. So scale, height, mm -hmm. I think all of that plays into this idea of intimacy with these characters. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the white. Um, I don't necessarily have a question, but thank you for sharing all of these works. I really appreciate them. Um, I think my biggest takeaway is that I like that you mentioned this inner fear that these characters are kind of, uh, not even kind of, just deliberately or intentionally taking up space in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to say except for thank you for saying that, and I'm glad that the work um, is impactful in that way. In terms of color, it was really important to me when trying to figure out what I wanted to say with this work, it was important for me to be able to feel limitless, and I think be able to being able to use any color that I want and mixing colors that maybe traditionally wouldn't go together mm -hmm. and finding a way to make it work felt really powerful, feels really powerful for me. And I, I only want to feel limitless. I only want to feel like I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and painting allows me to feel that. Okay, we have time for one last question, and you're up. <laughs> Yeah. And like, I know it's very limiting to talk about the art, but it's not only like, like, what is your process? Acrylic um, is quite new for me. I've used it on paper, which we don't have any works on paper here in the presentation, but um, with the Guardians, I wanted a different feeling in the background. So most of the painting is oil, but the way that I set up those paintings is that I wanted some sort of washy, inky kind of background that was safe for my lungs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so acrylic allows me to do that, but then I can build on top of the acrylic with the texture of the oil. But if I had to choose, oil is my first and only love. Well, we have to wrap up. Do, do you have any final closing thoughts you'd like to? Um, just that I'm so grateful to be here and it's been, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a really amazing moment to share with you all and I'm happy that the works are here at such a great institution and I'm thankful for the work that we've done together and the, the team that's come together to, to make this happen. So I'm, I'm really happy with, with how it turned out. I mean, same. <laughs> we did it. Very pleased we did it. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much to you, Nadine, for, for all of your thoughts and this honestly very wonderful conversation. And thank you all for being here tonight. I, I'm really glad we could all be in the room together. Me too. Uh, yeah. And we are very lucky this show has a, a lovely long run. So it's up through May of next year. So come once, come twice, bring friends, bring family, you know. Yeah. Bring everybody. Great. And, and come see it. So thank you all thank very you much. All. <laughs>